So this is a chapter three polynomial functions practice test. You can find it on the link below. Um, go download it if you want, print it out, try it and then come back. Or you can just follow along as I take it up here. Okay, so the first question says sketch the graph of a polynomial function that satisfies all the following characteristics. And they're listed down here, so I'm gonna to have to shift up and down here. Okay, so let's look at what you were given here. It says f at minus two equals eight, f at two equals this. So all these are, these are just points, right? These are points on the graph, points on the graph. So let's go plug those in. So um, it says minus two and eight. So I'm gonna put a little dot there. f two and minus one, f at six is two. The y-intercept is 2. Well, you should know where, where y-intercept is. There's another point on your graph. f at x is greater than or equal to 0 when x is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so that means it's going to cross here, right? So it's going to be greater than or equal to 0 for x less than 1. Um, then it also gives you another... Um, area of positivity here. That all, that's all it means. It's just going to be above or on the x-axis between these two numbers and this one. It's going to be under the x-axis. That means f at x is less than zero. It just means your y values, right? The y values are under the x-axis between this and this. And the domain is x is an element of real numbers. So we know right away that there are no asymptotes. No asymptotes. And these areas are just telling us where we're above or below the x-axis. So it says f at x is greater than or equal to 0 when x is less than or equal to 1. So that makes sense here. So we can come down like this. So that's all true. We can put an arrow on the end of this because it says the domain is x is an element of real numbers. And it's also greater than or equal to 0 be between 4 and 10. So between 4 and 10, it's greater than or equal to 0. So that means this could go like this, right? So this didn't mean it was going to be a maximum value. It, it just tells you it's a point on the graph, right? So don't, don't think it has to be the peak or the maximum value. It doesn't say that. And then it says that the uh, function is below 0 between 1 and 4 and greater than 10. So between 1 and 4 and greater than 10. And there you go. It's pretty simple. Okay, state true or false. In odd degree polynomial functions, if y approaches negative infinity when x approaches positive infinity. So let's make a little sketch. So as x approaches positive infinity, this is going to be approaching negative infinity. So it's going down. Then y will approach infinity when x approaches negative infinity. In other words, it's going to be going this way in an odd degree polynomial function. Well, yes, it, it holds for... Um, odd degree polynomial functions that have a negative leading coefficient that wasn't stated in here. So this would be true. It will, if this is going this way, that's going this way. And if it was an even one, then it would be vice versa, right? It'd be going this way. Okay, so that's true. An absolute maximum point or an absolute minimum point exists if the domain is X is an element of real numbers. Well, no, we don't have an absolute min or max because, as you remember, it could have just been a line like this. There is no max or min. It goes on forever in both directions, so that would be false. In even degree polynomial functions, as x approaches plus or minus infinity, y always approaches positive infinity. Well, that's true if you have a leading coefficient that is positive, but you could have a leading coefficient that's negative. So it's not always, so that would be false. An absolute maximum point and an absolute minimum point exist if the domain is x is an element of real numbers. Well, that doesn't hold true for a parabola, does it? A parabola only has one 
minimum point. It doesn't have a maximum point. These go on forever. So the answer is false. Okay. Mm, page two. Uneven degree polynomial function has a minimum of one turning point. An even degree polynomial function. So a minimum of one turning point. So even degree polynomials goes like this. That had one turning point. If it was a fourth degree, it could go like this, and in which case it would have three turning points. It has a minimum. It has to turn around once because it's going to end up in the same direction. So that would be true. And the last one, the maximum number of turning points is equal to the degree of the polynomial. Well, you should know that that would be false because it's always one less, right? So this would be a degree of four and it has three turning points. This is a degree of two, it has one turning point. So it's one less, so that's false. Sketch the both even, I shouldn't say the, sketch the even, or sketch both even and odd polynomial functions with positive and negative leading coefficients. Make sure I know which one is which. Well, we could do a parabola, right? So there's an even, even with a positive leading coefficient, means it's going up. Here's one with a negative leading coefficient, negative leading coefficient. This one, an odd um, like this is positive. Remember, like a positive slope of a positive line. So positive, and this one would be negative. Negative. That's not a very good drawing, is it? It's kind of, it's kind of like a bad, a bad line. It it doesn't look cubic and it doesn't look linear. Let's make it look a little more cubic. There we go. Okay, sketch each graph below. Note, I'm only evaluating roots and direction and understand that the exact graphs will not fit on these grids. Hmm. Thanks, Ms. Havrat. Okay, so let's look at these. What is this telling you? It tells you the zeros, right? You also need to know what the degree is and what the leading coefficient is. Not what it is, but whether it's positive or negative. So I have zeros of minus two, and this one would be two thirds, and this one would give me four. So I'm gonna put those dots on first. If I expanded this, it would be third degree cubic function, right? One, one, one makes three. And these are all single roots and the leading coefficient is positive. So that means I'm starting in this quadrant and ending in this quadrant. So I'm going to go like this, like this, and like this. Okay, so in other words, I didn't check out how far this would go down or this would go up. I'm just showing you the the direction and the, the sketch of the graph. Okay, this one, what are the zeros? Well, we have minus three and we have two, which is a double root. Okay, watch that, that's a two and four. What is the degree of this function? One, two, three, four. It's a degree of four and it is going to have a positive leading coefficient. That means it's gonna start in this quadrant and end in this quadrant. We also know this is a double root, so this is going to pass through, this is going to come up and touch it, and then it's going to go back up through here. And the last one here, we have a degree of 3, 4, it's a degree of 4, negative leading coefficient. Um, the zeros are 1, and negative 2 is a triple root, a triple root, right? So triple root means you're going to do this, right? You're going to kind of slip through and go back up. So it's a negative leading coefficient though. So that means I'm going to be starting in this quadrant and ending in this one. The two, the minus two is my triple root. So I'm going to come up and I'm going to do a whoopee like that. And then I'm going to come back down like this. You could probably figure out what the y-intercept would be. That would be uh, minus one, positive two, and eight is 16, so this is way up here. That's probably why I said this isn't gonna fit on your grid. Okay, on to question five. I printed these out and of course they're all on different pages. I'll flip this over. Number five, provide an equation for the cubic function shown below. 
Okay, so we need to know where the roots are, whether they're single or double. This has a root of minus 3, so I'm going to put x plus 3. It's even. Notice how it just touches here. And this other 0 here is going to be x minus 2, and it is a single root. Okay, don't stop there. You can say y equals or f at x equals, but we need to evaluate the a value. Right, we've got to find a, and to do that, we need a, another coordinate. So the best one would probably be this one right here, 0 and minus 9. So 0 minus 9 is a point on the graph. And so I'm going to plug that in so that I can evaluate the a value. So minus 9 is equal to a times 0 plus 3 squared times 0 minus 2. 3 squared is 9, times minus 2 is minus 18, so I have minus 18a, so a is going to be equal to 1 half. Okay, so that was 9, times minus 2 is negative 18, just double checking and positive. Okay, so I get y equals 1 half x plus 3 squared x minus 2. That's the equation for that lovely function. Okay, now we're moving on to number six. Make sure when you divide these out, I often get students that will say the answer is two because they didn't take two seconds to do this, right? Don't make that mistake. It's a very simple one to do. Describe the transformations applied to y equals x cubed to create this. Okay, so the two thirds, that's a vertical, vertical compression by a factor of two-thirds. And then the minus two means it was shifted horizontally, horizontal shift, two units, and remember x is weird, so it's going right. And the plus five is a vertical shift up five units. That was an easy three marks. Don't you wish you were in my class? Write the equation of the function that has been transformed from y equals x to the fourth. So that means this is your parent function, and we're going to apply a number of changes. Vertically compressed by a factor of one half. So that means a is going to be one half. Reflected in the x-axis, that means a is going to be negative one half. Horizontally compressed by a factor of two thirds, so that means k is going to be equal to 1 over that because when you figure out the compression, you do 1 over this, right? So you've got to flip it over again. Shifted to the left 2 units. So d is equal to 2, but we're going, or minus 2, but when we plug it in, it's going to become plus 2, right? And up 5 units. So that means y is equal to, we put in our minus 1 half big bracket for our k value, 3 halves, x minus minus means plus 2, close the bracket, the fourth power, because it's x to the fourth, and then plus 5. And you could double check, like go back after you've written it out and say, okay, that means this, 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 and, and double check your answer because you, you do know all the transformations. Okay, number 8 Ooh, is up here. Calculate this thing, divided by this thing, using long division. Okay, long division, remember, you got to, let me straighten this out, it drives me crazy. Okay, so I'm going to put x plus 3 over here, and I'm going to divide it into this thing. Now remember, when you write these out, to make sure, make sure that you have a place for everything. So there's no x squared in here, so I have to add 0x squared, or else it's going to really throw you off. You won't know what you're doing wrong, and it will be very frustrating. Okay, so I need to get rid of 2x to the 4th, so I need to multiply by 2x cubed. That gives me 2x to the 4th. Remember, you're trying to get rid of one number at a time here. And Probably a good idea for you to put a minus sign there. You need to subtract these because that's when people make mistakes with the positives and negatives. So 5 minus 6 is minus x cubed, and I bring down the 0x squared. Now I want to get rid of this, so I need a minus x squared. 
So I get minus x cubed minus 3x squared. Subtract minus and minus, gone. Plus minus and minus means plus 3x squared. I bring down the minus 6x. I want to get rid of 3x squared, so I add 3x up here. Multiply it, 3x squared plus 9x. Subtract 6 minus plus is minus 15x and bring down the 1. Last number here, I want to get rid of negative 15x, so I need minus 15 to multiply out to get 0. So 15 times 3 is 45. And I'm minusing a minus, so that gives me 46 for my remainder. Okay, so it says write your answer in the form of a division statement. So that means that 2x to the 4th plus 5x cubed um, plus, minus 6x plus 1 is equal to this, that's your numerator, 2x cubed 3x minus 15. I shouldn't say numerator, it's your quotient times the divisor times x plus 3 plus 46 and x is not equal to negative 3. Okay, so um, what was I going to say here? I thought of something while I was writing that. Uh, I don't remember. Maybe it'll come to me later on. Okay, so that's what you want to write out. So this, oh, I know what I was going to say. If you can't remember which order to write it out, do something like uh, 3 into 8. Okay, so that would give you 8 is equal to 2 times 3 plus 2. Okay, so that way you, you'll know how to write that division statement out. Okay, divide this by x minus 1 using synthetic division. So remember synthetic division, you look at this, and you're going to put a 1 there, write an upside down division sign, and write the numbers that are in your, your uh, function here. So 3, there's no x squared, so I need a 0 again. And you would have got two things wrong if you had to remember that both times. So 3, 0, 5, minus 6. I bring down the 3, and I start multiplying. And I add them. And I multiply, and I add those, and I multiply, and I add them. Okay, so it didn't ask for a division statement, but I would still, at least, you have to give some kind of statement. Um, you could do one like this. Minus 6 divided by x minus 1 equals, and I have 3x squared plus 3x plus 8. Remainder Two. Or if you did a, the division statement, which I probably would have wanted in this solution, I would have written it out as this. Um, 3x squared plus 3x plus 8 times x minus 1 plus 2. And then I would have had what this is equal to. Right? 3x cubed plus 5x minus 6 equals this stuff. And um, x is not equal to 1. Can't divide by a 0. Okay, without dividing, what is the remainder when this is divided by x minus 2? So that's saying, do you remember what the remainder theorem says? So if this is divided by um, x minus 2, um, f at 2 gives you the remainder. So f at 2 equals, and then you've got to plug that in to this. Now remember it's it's quite a big number. 2 to the 5th, 12 times 2 squared, minus 11. F at 2 equals, let me see I did it somewhere here. Just so we don't have to waste time. You can figure that out on your own. I get minus 414. So that's using the remainder theorem. Therefore the remainder, always do a nice work for your teacher is minus 414. Okay, number 11. Going to the last page now. The polynomial x cubed, 6x cubed, mx squared, nx minus 5, has a factor of this. When it is divided by this, the remainder is this. What is m and n? 
Okay, so hopefully you did a couple of these in your, sorry, in your homework assignment. And you need to make a little statement here. If it has a factor of x minus 1, so I'm going to say if x plus 1 is a factor, and this is using your factor theorem, then f at minus 1 equals 0. And this is using the remainder theorem because they're telling you what the remainder is. So if divided by x minus 1, I, can't, I thought I was going to be able to do something short form. So if divided by um, x minus 1, the remainder is minus 4, then f at uh, 1 has to be equal to negative 4. So f at 1 is negative 4, f at minus 1 equals 0, and then you're just going to do a little bit of do a little bit of two equations and two unknowns here. So I'm going to write it out like this. And I'm going to do f at minus 1. So 6 at minus 1, everywhere I see an x, and minus 1 plus n times minus 1 minus 5 has to be equal to 0. So if you do the math here, you'd have minus 6 plus m minus n minus 5 equals 0, and m minus n is equal to 11. Okay, so I have one equation with two unknowns. And now you're going to make another equation over here. So I have 6 at 1 cubed plus m times 1 squared plus n times 1 minus 5 has to be equal to negative 4. We're using the remainder theorem again. So I have 6 plus m plus n minus 5 equals minus 4. So m plus n equals 6 minus 5 is 1. Bring it over here. I get minus 5. So now I have two equations with two unknowns. I can line them up right underneath each other and use good old elimination that you learned and loved in grade 10. And if I add these two equations, I can get rid of the n's. If I subtracted them, I could get rid of the m's. Your choice. I'm just going to add them up. So that gives me 2m is equal to, these are gone, my, uh, 11 minus 5 is 6. So that means m is equal to 3. So if m is equal to 3, what's n equal to? So if m equals 3 m minus n equals 11, 3 minus n equals 11, minus n equals 8, and n is equal to negative 8. So you can double check that, so your answers are here. m is 3, and n is negative 8. Factor the following completely. 3x cubed minus 192. Okay, so the first thing you need to look for always and forevermore is a common factor. And it divides by 3. Now you need to remember your rules for um, sum and difference of squares. So if I have cubed, sorry, if I have a cubed plus b cubed, that's equal to, oh, sorry, this was the minus one. We need the other one anyway in a minute here. But um, a cubed minus b cubed is a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared. So that's what I'm going to do for this one. So my cube root of x is x and the cube root of 64 is 4. Those are my a and my b values. So I'm going to say this is equal to 3 times. Don't forget your 3 or else it won't expand properly. So a minus b is going to be x minus 4. And then a squared is x squared plus a times b. That will be 4x plus b squared is 16. That was a nice easy one to do. The next one is a little more difficult. It's the plus one. Um, I'm going to write up the rule here just so I have more room. a cubed plus b cubed equals a plus b times a squared minus a b plus b squared. 
Okay, so when you look at this, this is everything is cubed and that's everything cubed. So that means my a is going to be x plus 2 and my b is going to be x minus 5. And I'm just going to plug that into this equation here. So I have a plus b, so I have x plus 2 plus x plus, uh, minus 5. And then that is all going to be times, so I should put that in big brackets, times a squared, so that's x plus 2 squared, minus a times b, so x plus 2 times x minus 5, and then plus b squared, so x minus 5 squared. And there we go. Okay, so now I need to do all the, the baby math here. x plus 2 plus x minus 5. That's 2x minus 3, close the brackets. And I need to do a lot of squaring binomials here, and hopefully you're good at that. I'm going to put a big bracket, and I'll show you why. So squared, twice the product, squared, that's this one, minus, now minus. That's why I put another bracket here, because I want you to make a bracket before, so that you remember to change all the signs. You're minusing all of this. So x squared minus 3x minus 10. And the last one is going to be squared twice a product. That's minus 10x plus 25. Okay, now it's just a little bit of cleanup and we're done this lovely test. Hopefully you found this helpful. So I'm going to write it out like this. 4x plus 4 minus x squared plus 3x plus 10. Don't forget x squared minus 10x plus 25. And finally, I'm just going to simplify that big bracket and we're going to be done. So I have an x squared minus an x squared. I'm left with one of them. I have 4x plus 3 is 7 minus 10 is minus 3x. And I have 4 plus 10 is 14 plus 29 is 39. And there you go. Hopefully you found that not too hard and that um, your teacher doesn't make your test any harder than mine. All the best. Make sure you subscribe, please, so that um, we can get our numbers up a little bit here. Bye.